Greetings YouTubers and welcome to the Gear Bench. This video is part two in a series on backcountry water treatment. Part one discussed boiling versus pasteurization and the consequent savings to be had in time, fuel, and weight. And I do recommend you start at the beginning if you haven't already seen that video as each installment builds upon concepts introduced previously. Today we're here to talk about chemical disinfection methods. And in this video you'll find information on the three major classes of chemical disinfectants made for backcountry use with pros and cons for each method, including disinfection strengths, limits, and side effects, the principles of dose versus time, and log reduction rates, a look at the relative weight efficiency of each method, and strategies for use in the field, including how to combine methods for even greater effectiveness. And if absolutely none of that is of interest to you, escape now while you still can. In part one, we talked about log removal rates. And recall that one log of removal equals a 90% reduction in pathogens. Two log reduction equals 99% and so forth. The FDA sets the reduction standard for commercial pasteurization at five log or 99.999%. Remember also that because of the way a water pasteurization indicator works and the actual temperatures reached during field use, we were getting several orders of magnitude more than this, essentially enjoying extravagant margins of safety. Well, drinking water disinfection is handled by the Environmental Protection Agency, and they also set log reduction standards. In order to put this sentence on the package of your product, it must accomplish at least six log reduction of bacteria, four log reduction of viruses, three log reduction of cysts. And those were the three major classes of pathogens discussed in part one. And each disinfection method has its own strengths and weaknesses regarding each of these microbial culprits. Remember that heat was slowest to affect viruses, so the pasteurization standard was set for them, leaving extra margins of safety for both cyst and bacterial reduction. For chemicals, it's sort of the opposite. Bacteria and viruses are pickled to death far more easily than some of your protozoan cysts. In fact, we really ought to have four categories of pathogen instead of three, because one type of cyst is so much harder to kill chemically than everything else, even other cysts. So, with that foundation in place, let's look at some of the portable, lightweight options for chemical disinfection of drinking water that are practical for backcountry use. They come in wet or dry options as either drops or tablets, but the form isn't what's important to their microbiocidal effectiveness. It's the active ingredients that matter. And the first one to talk about is one of the oldest, iodine. Potable aqua tablets were developed in the 1940s for the US Army, and they've been in use by outdoor enthusiasts ever since. They come in a glass bottle with 50 tablets, it takes two tablets per quart or liter of water, so there are 25 doses per bottle and the whole thing weighs 32.3 grams. Now, iodine is famous for leaving a brownish tint to the water and a noticeable medicine-like or chemical taste. And if that bothers you, they sell the bottles in pairs matched with a second tablet to counteract the color and the taste. It's just ascorbic acid or vitamin C which causes the iodine to precipitate out of solution. But that also deactivates the disinfection qualities, so make sure you don't add the taste tablets until after your 35-minute treatment time has elapsed. Now, apart from taste, there are two main drawbacks to using iodine, and one is the potential for adverse health effects. The maximum recommended dietary dose of iodine is 2 milligrams per day, but that's for every single day all year long, year after year. For short-term or emergency use, the daily dose may be much higher. A tablet of iodine contains 8 milligrams, and it takes 2 tablets per liter, so that's 16 milligrams per bottle. If you drink 4 liters per day, that's a total of 64 milligrams, 32 times the regular dietary limit. How bad is that? It turns out to be difficult to say, reason being, individual sensitivity is highly variable. Apparently, there's a portion of the population that is particularly susceptible to excess amounts of iodine, and the trick is, you may not know ahead of time if you are one of them. It has to do with iodine uptake by your thyroid. And some people are walking around with subclinical hyperthyroidism. The subclinical meaning it hasn't risen to the point where symptoms manifest enough to be detected, so there's been no clinical diagnosis. In other words, you could have it and just not know it. Now, should you be one of these people, suddenly starting to take iodine in doses like these could result in unexpected side effects, which could include rashes, acne, symptoms resembling a sinus cold, and gastrointestinal upset. And this is rare though. Average incidence was found to be 1.7%, but varies by region and was as high as 7% in Sweden. P. 
Peace Corps data indicated that people who consumed greater than 30 milligrams a day for six months had a high incidence of goiter. So there have been recorded incidents of travelers becoming hyperthyroid from using iodine tablets to disinfect water, but they're few. Symptoms are usually mild and the condition typically reverts to normal after a few months. Because of this, iodine treatment is not recommended for the following people. Those with known or suspected thyroid problems or families with related history, those who are pregnant, those with chronic dialysis or cystic fibrosis, and patients taking medication containing iodine or lithium. In summary, the use of iodine for water disinfection requires a risk-benefit decision similar to other medical interventions that are used to prevent illness in high-risk populations. The CDC's Yellow Book Chapter 2 discusses water disinfection for travelers. Because iodine has physiologic activity, the World Health Organization recommends limiting iodine water disinfection to a few weeks. I also found reports that the European Union was going to ban iodine for use in disinfecting drinking water and that it will no longer be sold or supplied for that purpose. But even if you are one of the majority who can tolerate higher doses, there is still the other main drawback to consider iodine's lack of effectiveness for certain cysts. A study published in the Journal of Wilderness and Environmental Medicine looked at iodine with specific regard to Giardia and Cryptosporidium. They did two tests for each type of cyst, a general and a worst case water condition that might be found in the field. For Giardia in the general case water, it took 20 minutes to achieve three log inactivation. In worst case water, it took 50 minutes to get that same three logs. A key difference between the two test waters was the pH. So, unless you carry pH strips and test your water in the field, you won't know if the regular treatment time is appropriate or whether you might need two and a half times longer to get the same job done. And that was for Giardia. Cryptosporidium is another matter entirely. After 20 minutes in the manufacturer's recommended dose of iodine solution, only 10% of Cryptosporidium oocysts were inactivated. After four hours, only 66 to 81% were inactivated. That's less than one log of reduction. Even after 12 hours, you still wouldn't have the EPA's minimum of three logs. And this led the study's authors to conclude, these data strongly suggest that iodine disinfection is not effective in inactivating cryptosporidium oocysts in water. Because this organism is common in all surface waters, it is recommended that another method of treatment be used before ingestion. And a technical information paper published by the U.S. Army Public Health Command also spells out some of the issues with iodine for disinfection. In general, iodine is most effective against bacteria, followed by viruses. Iodine is least effective against cysts, and iodine is not a, an effective disinfectant against Cryptosporidium parvum oocysts. Now, like all chemical disinfection methods, iodine's effectiveness is reduced when it is colder. The paper recommends a two-fold increase in either contact times or dosage for every 10 degrees C decrease in water temperature. Turbidity, or the cloudiness of your water, may or may not have much effect on the disinfection capability of iodine. It depends on the type of turbidity, whether it's organic or mineral, silt or clay. It's always advisable to pre-filter your water when using chemical methods, as some of the particles in murky water can deactivate your solution or provide safe haven for the microbes you're trying to treat. And in conclusion, iodine solutions are effective disinfectants against bacteria, viruses, and giardia cysts. They are not effective against cryptosporidium oocysts. And giardia cysts are more resistant to iodine disinfection than bacteria or viruses. So achieving adequate giardia cyst inactivation should ensure adequate bacteria and virus inactivation. And to their credit, Potable Aqua is completely honest about this on their label. On the front, it only says that questionable water is made bacteriologically safe. And it says, proven effective against giardia lamblia when used as directed. And on the back, it specifically states, Potable Aqua has not been shown to inactivate cryptosporidium cysts. In addition to products specifically marketed for recreational outdoor use, there might be some things already in your home applicable for this circumstance. Best Glide, the makers of some first-class survival kits for the military, used to have an article about water disinfection on their site. It's gone now, which is why I always cut and paste copies for myself. Anyway, in the article, they do the dosage math for iodine sources commonly found in a lot of people's medicine cabinets. And their ratios were based on a single iodine tablet. Since Potable Aqua recommends two, the numbers should be doubled. Therefore, for povidone iodine, better known in the U.S. as betadine, it's 8 drops per quart. And if you happen to have one of these prep pads in your first aid kit, 
you could soak that in your one liter bottle, sort of like a tea bag. probably should remove it before drinking though. Next up, chlorine. Probably the most widely used drinking water disinfectant of all. In fact, unless you're on a private well, if you fill up a glass at your sink right now, the water most likely contains chlorine. And that's because most municipal agencies across the U.S. actually require the addition to keep things from growing in your water. As such, chlorine has probably been studied the most. A study published in Applied Microbiology compared chlorine and iodine as disinfectants for swimming pool water. In it, they looked at disinfection of two test organisms, E. coli and Streptococcus faecalis. It took two parts per million of iodine to provide a result equivalent to just 0.6 parts per million of free chlorine. At over three times the effectiveness, it takes less than a third the dose, and that means less chemical to drink for the same disinfection. There are a variety of household sources of chlorine, a couple of which are safe to use for drinking water. Good old liquid bleach that you use for laundry is one of them. Clorox even gives you the recipe on their website. Two drops per quart, three if the water is cloudy. Now mind you, that's for an approximate 6% solution. If you're using a different concentration, you'll have to adjust accordingly. Also, make sure you use only the plain bleach, no scent or other additives. Now a trick to dealing with chlorine sources is being mindful of the active ingredient. In the case of liquid bleach, the label will say sodium hypochlorite. And that's obviously technically true, but the actual disinfectant is what's known as free or available chlorine. In solution, that's what kills the bugs. One drawback of the sodium hypochlorite in liquid bleach is a relatively short shelf life. After three to five months, depending on the temperature, your solution is no longer at 6%. It may still be adequate for laundry and home surface disinfection, but its use for drinking water might be compromised unless you begin to adjust the dose. There are other label ingredients that can provide you with the same free chlorine. And one such is calcium hypochlorite, better known as pool shock. Different name, but it's really just another salt of hypochlorous acid. Dissolve the granules in water, and you'll get free chlorine just the same. Zapit 73 is a brand of calcium hypochlorite sold for pool treatment, but they publish a service bulletin with several pages of instructions for use in all kinds of drinking water facilities. So when shopping, look for high test calcium hypochlorite in the 70 to 73% range with no additives for pH or algae control. An advantage to this dry source of free chlorine is an extended shelf life. According to HDH brand, it should last 30 months when stored appropriately. The EPA puts out a two page pamphlet on emergency disinfection of drinking water. And in addition to mixing instructions for sodium hypochlorite, including both a 6% and 8.25% liquid bleach, they also provide a recipe for using high test granular calcium hypochlorite. The thing about HTH is that it's extremely concentrated. And according to the EPA, you mix one heaping teaspoon into two gallons of water. That's about a quarter ounce or just seven grams. Except that's not for drinking. It's for making a stock chlorine solution that you will in turn dilute again for drinking water. And the ratio is one to a hundred. So in other words, that seven grams in two gallons makes your own liquid bleach and then you use your DIY Clorox to go ahead and disinfect per instructions. Well that means those two gallons of homemade bleach will treat 200 gallons of drinking water. That's a lot of water for just seven grams of granules. Now these amounts aren't practical for trail use so I scaled down the math a bit. The solution prescribed actually yields five parts per million chlorine in drinking water mix. Six and a quarter parts per million is what's been tested for backcountry use to meet EPA's log reduction standards. So to get there, it works out to about one gram per liter. But again, that's to make a chlorine disinfectant solution, not to drink. If, as a backup, you wanted to carry a single gram of calcium hypochlorite, you could use it to produce a liter of homemade bleach that would then disinfect 100 liters of drinking water. So bleach is everywhere. It's in your cupboard, it's in your pool, it's already in the water you drink, and it is recommended by the authorities. But there are some issues that we should talk about. To start with, free available chlorine is broken down by pee, poop, sweat, and dirt from bodies. 
Well, these were some of the very things we're trying to disinfect against. And by being broken down, that means the chlorine is effectively used up, so there is less to kill germs. And that means you'll either need to add more chlorine or wait longer. Also, chlorine is just one half of what's called the disinfection team. Any pool owner could tell you what the other half is. pH. To make a complicated chemical process simple, regard a chlorine solution as actually comprising chlorine in two different forms. And one is better at disinfecting than the other. And the ratio at which the two versions will populate a solution is based upon the pH. So at high pH, the weaker version dominates, and that renders the chlorine solution less effective. At low pH, there is more of the strong type, making the chlorine a better disinfectant. And unfortunately, the variability is significant, which leads me to bring up another key concept in chemical disinfection, CT values. With heat, we had the factors of temperature and time. The hotter you get, the less time you have to wait for pasteurization. And there's a close analogy with chemical disinfection. It's concentration in time, hence the term CT value. This can get very complicated, and I won't dwell too much on it. It's just the core principle we're after here. A CT value is just the chemical concentration in milligrams per liter of your solution multiplied by the time in minutes of exposure or treatment. And the resulting units are in milligram minutes per liter. The idea is that you can get the same disinfection result from one of two ways. Suppose your desired level of disinfection is achieved with a chemical that is dosed to one milligram per liter, and it takes one hour at that concentration. If you double the dose, it halves the time. So a chemical concentration of two milligrams per liter would only require 30 minutes for the same log reduction. Similarly, a half milligram per liter would still work, but that would take two hours to treat. So this could be useful in the field under a few scenarios. If you're in a hurry, you can add two pills instead of one to cut the time in half. There are practical limits to this, of course, the most obvious being that all of these chemicals go from being safe to toxic above a certain limit. Still, within a narrow margin, there is room for flexibility. Or, you may be in the situation of limiting the dose for some reason. Maybe you're concerned about drinking chemicals or you just don't like the taste. If you're willing to wait, just cut back on the disinfectant and let it brew longer. You might also be forced to cut back if you're running out of pills. And then it would be good to know that you can ration your treatment without sacrificing safety at the expense of time. So when using commercially prepared products, you don't need an actual CT value. Just base all variations to the manufacturer's recipe on this basic principle of concentration versus time. Now that's the easiest way, but I do see some videos from people who like to carry a small dropper bottle of bleach. So if you are someone who prefers DIY disinfection, you'll need to be aware of something like this. The Environmental Science and Program Management Division of Nova Scotia publishes procedures for the treatment of drinking water. And Appendix D contains the log inactivation information that they use, which is actually derived from the US EPA's data. Just a brief look to appreciate how rigorously they've got the whole system down, but also how complicated it would be to actually try and get this specific in the back country. You're looking at hundreds of CT values for free chlorine in regards to Giardia. Now, how do you pick one? It depends on all of the following. First, how much residual chlorine do you want? Then choose the level of log inactivation. Next, you need to know the pH of your water. And all of that only applies if the temperature is 5C. You see, this is only one page of many. You need a separate page for each temperature range in question. And Appendix D here contains table sets for every 5 degrees C. Now, you could fix your preference for residual chlorine ahead of time, say at 2.6 parts per million. And the log reduction required for Giardia to meet EPA standards is 3. But without both a thermometer and some pH test strips, you'll have no idea where you should be on this table, or even if it's the right page. An example to illustrate the point. Wilderness water could very easily range from 5C to 15C, depending on the season and the source. And that alone gives you three whole pages worth of tables to choose from. Well, what about natural variations in pH? This article from the Fondrist Environmental Learning Center gives some idea. Natural precipitation, both rain and snow, has a pH near 5.6 due to contact with CO2 and other atmospheric influences. So, if you're melting snow or collecting rain runoff, your water is at the acid end of things. Freshwater lakes, ponds, and streams usually have a pH of 6 to 8, depending on the surrounding soil and bedrock. In deeper lakes where stratification occurs, the pH of water is generally higher near the surface and lower at greater depths. 
know, the surface of a lake is where you'll most likely draw from. So now look at the range and CT values you're faced with across the spread of water conditions you can realistically encounter in the wilderness. Given our previously stated preferences for a 2.6 part per million residual and 3 log reduction, 15 seawater at 5.6 pH gives you a CT of 60, but 5 seawater at 8.5 pH requires a CT of 312. And that's a difference of over 5 times. A treatment that's just right after 20 minutes for one bottle of water could take 100 minutes to get there for your next, depending on where you get the water and what temperature it is. So assuming you are not carrying a pH test kit and a thermometer, this level of specificity is not practical in the field. But for anybody that's still interested, I put a link to a 21-page guide on CT disinfection made simple. As far as side effects go, chlorine isn't like iodine. Within a moderate range, it is generally tolerated well. From the background document used by the World Health Organization to develop their guidelines for drinking water quality. In humans and animals exposed to chlorine in drinking water, specific adverse treatment related effects have not been observed. It was concluded that hypochlorites are not classifiable as to their carcinogenicity to humans. And if there is a concern, it's not with the chlorine itself, but with the possible disinfection byproducts. As mentioned previously, the various chemical species in a chlorine solution break down and react with other substances they encounter in the water. And this produces chemical byproducts. Some of these can be dangerous. One such group of byproducts are the trihalomethanes. Many are considered carcinogenic. And they were actually the subject of the first drinking water regulations issued under the U.S. Safe Drinking Water Act. The other byproducts of potential concern are haloacetic acids. When consumed in drinking water, HAA are easily absorbed into the bloodstream. They've been linked to injuries of the liver, kidney, eyes, nerves, the reproductive system. And animal studies have shown that prolonged exposure in drinking water resulted in cancer. Now, I'm not trying to scare you away from any particular chemical method any more than I'm attempting to dismiss possible concerns. I figure I should just let you know what I've found so you can decide for yourselves. To that end, the American Chemistry Council published a paper on drinking water chlorination, and they acknowledge that the EPA considers most THMs and HAAs to be either possible or probable human carcinogens, but they state the low levels typically found in drinking water would be slight. And they note, the World Health Organization's International Program on Chemical Safety concluded, none of the chlorination disinfection byproducts studied to date is a potent carcinogen at concentrations normally found in drinking water. To some extent, that's reassuring, but if there's a catch, it's in the use of words like typically and normally. And it goes back to how these byproducts are formed. It's by the reaction of chlorine with organic matter in the water. So when they say levels are typically low, it's because the agencies that chlorinate your water pre-filter it first, and sometimes even pre-treat it with other chemicals before introducing the chlorine. And this is all done in a specific effort to reduce these byproducts by reducing any organic material in the water prior to chlorination. So the EPA has a rather large water treatment manual on disinfection, and in section 4.9.2 on page 54, they discuss organic byproducts. Who says organic is always better for you? Listing the ways to minimize concentrations of THMs produced by chlorination, item number one, at least if you're Roman, is avoid chlorinating raw surface water and untreated groundwater susceptible to surface contamination. But, 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 isn't that exactly what we do when hiking? So my point is only this. While it's reassuring that normal drinking water has low levels of byproducts, it's carefully filtered and treated ahead of chlorination. If you were to just drop some chlorinating tablets directly into water like this, or this, you might be producing carcinogenic byproducts at levels beyond those that have been deemed safe under normal circumstances. Prudence would suggest that one do like the agencies do. Don't use this until after you've done this. In fact, the filter will help with the other main issue of using free chlorine for disinfection. And like iodine, chlorine is a halogen. And just like iodine, it also can't handle cryptosporidium. From the CDC's Yellow Book, some common waterborne parasites, such as cryptosporidium and possibly cyclospora, are poorly inactivated by chlorine and iodine-based disinfection at practical concentrations, even with extended contact times. And from the American Chemistry Council's report, 
Crypto is highly chlorine resistant and can be potentially life threatening in immunocompromised patients. It was the cause of the largest reported drinking water outbreak in U.S. history, affecting over 400,000 people in Milwaukee back in 1993. And between 2013 and 2014, cryptosporidium was the second most common cause of U.S. drinking water illnesses. So, a filter that can remove both organic matter and cysts would be an ideal precursor to chlorination. So pool or jacuzzi owners may be aware that the CDC does have guidelines for hyperchlorination to kill cryptosporidium. And the CT value for that is 15,300. In discussing healthy water and chlorine disinfection, the CDC sets a safe limit at four parts per million. Now that's for daily long-term consumption. Chlorine tablets for field use have been okayed by the EPA for up to 6.25 parts per million. But to kill crypto, according to the CDC's instructions, it would take a chlorine concentration of 20 parts per million over 12 hours to get the job done. And if you went as low as 10 parts per million, your treatment time goes to 25 and a half hours. Now, I suppose you could do that on trail if it was an emergency. You drop multiple tablets and wait all day. But then you'd still want a way to remove some of that chlorine before drinking. And they say you can pour the water back and forth between two clean containers to aerate it. Your guess is as good as mine as how long that would take. But post-treatment with an activated carbon filter could also do the trick. I've already decided I'll need to add a part four to this series on pre- and post-filtration options. The liquid bleach options we've been talking about aren't the only way to chlorinate your water. And while I have seen videos from people who carry a small dropper bottle into the bush, there is a better way. Now, aqua tabs have been around for decades, and they've been in use by millions of people all over the planet. And the active ingredient may look novel, but don't be fooled. Sodium dichloroisocyanurate is used as a source of free available chlorine in the form of hypochlorous acid, just like the sodium hypochlorite in laundry bleach or the calcium hypochlorite in pool shot. As such, it will share some of the drawbacks of chlorination, namely the risk of byproducts and an inability to adequately treat cryptosporidium. However, there are some distinct advantages to these tablets. A study published in the International Journal of Hygiene and Environmental Health I'll give you a second so you can get your copy and read along. Specifically compared NADCC tablets to bleach for drinking water disinfection. And while sodium hypochlorite releases all of its chlorine as free available chlorine, sodium dichloroisocyanurate only releases about 50%. It keeps the rest as a sort of chlorine reservoir. Why is that an advantage? Remember that impurities in the water don't just produce byproducts, they literally use up some of the free available chlorine. So this decreases your CT value and would require increasing the chlorine concentration back to nominal or waiting longer for treatment. So when you use drops in raw surface water, you may not be getting the PPM that you expect. Often, the CDC's instructions will include a caveat like, if you don't smell chlorine in the treated water, add more and try again. I suppose you could carry chlorine test strips in the field to make sure you're getting it right. They're pretty lightweight, compact, and cheap. Or you can pre-filter and use the tablets. If any remaining impurities break down some of your free available chlorine, the chemical equilibrium of your solution is disturbed, and this immediately releases further chlorine from your reservoir, restoring the concentration to preserve its strength. And this makes it a more stable and reliable disinfectant on the trail because it effectively self-buffers against the variability of the water sources that you might be required to treat. And that leads us to our last of the three major active ingredient types, chlorine dioxide. Say what now? I just finished saying we were done with chlorine and moving on to the third type, and then I say chlorine. And right about now, some of y'all want your money back. Well, this is probably the most frequent confusion I've encountered when reading articles or watching videos on this subject. These get lumped together with these as though they all work the same way. Chlorine dioxide is a neutral chlorine compound. It's very different from elemental chlorine, both in its chemical structure and in its behavior. When dissolved in water, chlorine dioxide does not hydrolyze. It remains ClO2 gas in solution. In other words, it doesn't come apart to produce free available chlorine like the previous chemicals do. From the EPA guidance manual on alternative disinfectants and oxidants, chlorine dioxide disinfects by oxidation, however, it does not chlorinate. 
This means you don't have to worry as much about trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids as possibly carcinogenic byproducts. This study in the Journal of Environmental Engineering and Science found that a switch from chlorine to chlorine dioxide led to an 85% reduction in THMs and a 60% reduction in HAAs. Now generally, chlorine dioxide is regarded as a more effective disinfectant than chlorine. Specifically, it's capable of killing cryptosporidium at practical doses and contact times, whereas neither iodine nor chlorine can. It's also up to five times faster than elemental chlorine at inactivating giardia. And at higher pH levels, chlorine dioxide has been found to be superior to chlorine in the inactivation of numerous viruses. In comparison to chlorine, studies have shown pH has much less effect on pathogen inactivation for viruses and cysts with chlorine dioxide than with chlorine, in the pH range from 6 to 8.5, which was the range of natural water sources discussed earlier. And in a study published in Infection Control and Hospital Epidemiology, chlorine dioxide was found to be more effective against Legionella. Over a period of 18 months, they increased dosage until positive test samples dropped from 60% to 10%. That's a nice bonus considering that bacterial Legionella has overtaken parasitic infections as the number one cause of U.S. drinking water associated outbreaks. Another difference between the two, chlorine adds taste and odor, whereas a common application of chlorine dioxide in drinking water in the United States has been for control of tastes and odors associated with algae and decaying vegetation. And that could be of particular value to hikers. It is also effective in destroying taste and odor producing phenolic compounds. One such compound you're likely to encounter in wilderness water is tannin. Many species of plants are rich in tannins. As vegetation falls and decays, tannins can leach into the soil and then seep into the groundwater or drain into lakes and streams. And this tints the water brown, making it look like tea. For just this purpose, chlorine dioxide has been in use at the Niagara Falls water treatment plant since 1944. Like chlorine, it is still affected by temperature. Going from 20C to 10C reduced the effectiveness of chlorine dioxide on cryptosporidium by 40%. Here's a chart of how the CT value can rise as temperature drops. Now, as far as side effects go, chlorine dioxide and chlorite, one of its byproducts, can cause irritation in the mouth, esophagus, or stomach if you eat or drink large amounts. And speaking of byproducts, disinfection with chlorine dioxide can result in the production of chlorites or in chlorates. And other than the aforementioned irritation if consumed in excess, I didn't find much in the way of serious consequences. The World Health Organization has a paper on the subject, which I will link below in case anybody is interested. To limit the production of chlorites and chlorates, mine the dose of chlorine dioxide and keep the reaction away from sunlight. So while your water is treating, either use an opaque bottle or wrap it up and tuck it away inside your pack until ready to drink. As far as commercial products go, here are some of the most common ones, at least in the U.S. Potable Aqua, the iodine people, also produce water purification tablets of sodium chlorate and sodium dichloroisocyanurate dihydrate. These react in water to produce chlorine dioxide. And as the package indicates, they are effective against not just bacteria and viruses, but cysts including cryptosporidium, something that has to remain absent from the iodine and chlorine products. And that's what allows them to put the magic phrase on the box. And Catadine, makers of the Bee Free Microfilter, also produce a chlorine dioxide tablet sold as MicroPure MP1. It's the exact same active ingredients in the same dose with the same treatment time. Now, a different approach is used in Aquamira's two part kit. And these drops make a good object lesson in how to approach gear analysis with a skeptical eye. In my research, I learned that the EPA doesn't regulate product claims made in advertising or on websites per se. It's the actual packaging that they police. If you want to put it on the box, it must first be submitted to and then approved by someone at the EPA. Now, as a case in point, I ran the EPA registration number given for the Aqua tabs shown earlier, and I found this letter. Medentech, the parent company of Aqua tabs, had submitted a label for EPA approval, and the EPA had rejected it. This is Medentech resubmitting the proposed label with the deficiencies noted by the EPA corrected. And what were those deficiencies? Three statements had to be deleted. And look at number one. It's the magic phrase, achieves EPA microbiological water purifier test standards. 
Now, presumably they were required to remove this claim since chlorine-based tablets are ineffective against cryptosporidium. Now, that's nothing against Aquatabs, really. They're as effective against bacteria, viruses, and Giardia as they have ever been. It just is what it is, or in this case, it isn't what it isn't. But what I take away from the example is the importance of the product claims made on the package itself. So quite a bit of nonsense can be slipped into an Amazon product description without being corrected. The label is the only place where claims are actually supervised. And I mean by the EPA itself. Obviously, false advertising claims can be litigated, but that's a whole other thing. So why the digression? Because these drops have been the subject of internet speculation, which took some trouble to track down. If you go to their website, you'll see the drops pictured over a rocky stream. The text goes on about how compact, lightweight, and easy to carry the bottles are, making them useful in virtually every situation and anywhere in the world. Now, clearly, they're marketing these to hikers as a field option. It even says, it's no wonder why the CDC recommends using chlorine dioxide for treating water in the backcountry. And that's true as far as it goes. The CDC does recommend chlorine dioxide as a compound, but not this particular product. These drops are not actually cleared by the EPA for that purpose. But it says right here, our EPA registered chlorine dioxide formula. Well, registered doesn't mean certified. And while they are indeed registered for legal sale in the United States, they are not certified by the EPA as a microbiological water purifier. So it goes back to what's on the actual label. Kills odor-causing bacteria and enhances the taste of stored potable water. Nothing about viruses or cysts, no log removal rates, nothing about making wilderness water safe to drink. Ostensibly, they're for keeping stored water from going funky. So, are there shenanigans at play? In a word, no. Aquamira drops have been widely used by hikers for decades. In fact, they're an outdoor gear lab top pick, and none other than Andrew Skirka's preferred go-to method for water purification. Now, however persuasive that is, of course, it's not official. The most important fact should be that after the drops are mixed as directed, the resulting active ingredient is the same as chlorine dioxide tablets and in the same dose. And were that the case, any lack of an official certification becomes more of a bureaucratic issue than a scientific one, and wouldn't necessarily imply any lack of actual effectiveness. So after noticing the discrepancy, I delved into research, and I found all kinds of conflicting statements. Some people said the drops are stronger, others said the tablets were more effective, and what was usually missing was any kind of actual reference. I call it IBS, Internet Blowhard Syndrome. If you make a statement like, the drops are five times stronger than the tablets, that's an empirical claim subject to proof, and you really ought to include a credible reference. If you didn't, it doesn't make you a bad person. It's probably happened to most everybody at some point. I know I've been guilty. It just means you temporarily suffered from a case of IBS. And that was internet blowhard syndrome, not the other IBS, although sometimes the symptoms can be similar. So what was the verdict on the drops? It took me a while, but I finally found this post by McNett Customer Service, and McNett is the parent company of Aquamira, and they addressed the issue of the drops versus the tablets. And this post was made in 2011, and I found it back in 2015. That's how long I've been collecting research. And it's not up anymore. Again, that's why I always make copies of everything. Anyway, I'll put the full post up here so you can read it if you're interested. But basically, they explain how they buy the chemicals in bulk. And the EPA registration actually belonged to the supplier. And as such, they didn't have control over how those chemicals were submitted for certification. They've since procured the registration, but the process for certification is long and expensive, and it requires lots of testing. They might not have done it still or decided not to bother. And they go on to explain that while the delivery methods may be different, the results are the same. You get the same chlorine dioxide as effective ingredient and in the same dose. And they also address some of the procedural requirements of using the drops, like accurately mixing the two parts, waiting the correct amount of time but no longer, and accounting for wind, temperature, and light conditions while playing field chemist for a drink of water. And if all of these requirements are met in the mixing and dispensing of the liquid ClO2 into the final container of water, the resultant concentration of ClO2 should be virtually identical to that of the tablets. So there you have it. So why go through all that? Well, to me, the research was valuable in developing a way to evaluate products skeptically. 
one real-world example of how to consider new products. Purinize claims to be a better way to purify. It is a new paragon in water purification. It offers greater protection and is decreed effective against not just bacteria, viruses, and protozoa, but also chemicals, heavy metals, and more. And it somehow manages to accomplish all of this without any of those harsh chemicals like iodine or chlorine dioxide. It's 100% natural and non-toxic, and it never expires. Well, that sounds incredible. Let's take a look. The words purify and purification are what's known as terms of art. Within the specific context of a particular field, they have a very precise technical definition. And as discussed, it's the EPA that sets it. So if you imply that your product is a purifier, there is an objective standard to meet. So when you see effective against microorganisms, yes. You know what's missing. What are the log reduction rates? And when you see tested according to EPA and NSF ANSI standards, you ask, which standards and did you pass? Tested does not mean certified. And when the directions say, depending on water quality, additional drops and wait time may be needed for best purification results. Well, I want to know how many more drops and how much longer. Those other chemicals can provide detailed tables of CT values. All of this weasel wording inspires skepticism. And to their credit, Purinize does post their lab results. And table 2 shows the percent reduction for bacteria, viruses, and giardia. And in a separate report, they show results for cryptosporidium. Let's put those up against the EPA's minimum standards for a microbiological water purifier and see how they compare. In order to qualify as purification, you need six log reduction of bacteria, which is 99.9999%. Well, Purinize achieves only 99.95%, or three and a half log. That's two and a half logs short of minimum, or 500 times less reduction than required. And as you can see, the challenge water for the test contained 10 to the eighth bacteria, or 100 million count per liter, after treatment with Purinize, 50,000 bacteria per liter still remained. For a proper EPA purifier, only 100 would be left. For viruses, Purinize managed 99.85% reduction, less than 3 log, 4 log is required. And that's 15 times more viruses left than are allowed. For Giardia, Purinize reduced 99%, or 2 logs, where 3 logs is the minimum. And that's 10 times as many cysts floating around in your water bottle than the EPA would permit to a product certified as a purifier. And for cryptosporidium, the numbers were even worse. Only 97.1% were reduced, where 99.9% are required under the standard. And that leaves 29 times more oocysts than the EPA would allow. One final kicker. Purinize says to let your treated water stand for 60 minutes with an unspecified extension depending on water quality. Now check out the detail of their lab's testing procedure. They let it sit for 24 hours and then passed it through another stage of filtration using an unspecified H2O Technologies Inc. system. In short, there can be a very big difference between being tested to EPA standards and actually passing that test. I'm starting to wrap it up now with a note on treatment times. For iodine, it's a total of 35 minutes. For the chlorine, it's 40. And for chlorine dioxide tablets, it says allow to react for four hours. It's that four hours that gets a lot of people. And I've seen it argued, why would you use the product that takes four hours when you can get these other options that work in just 35 to 40 minutes? Well, fair point, but only if you're laboring under the false presumption that these are all equally effective. The 4-hour one is the only pill that works on crypto. And here's the key part. Crypto is the only reason you need to wait 4 hours. Remember that bacteria and viruses are far easier to inactivate with chemicals than cysts. The treatment times are always based on the slowest pathogen to react. So for iodine and chlorine, that's Giardia. But since neither one of them can handle crypto, even after 12 hours, they just admit it's not covered and give a time based on the easier stuff. If you're using iodine or chlorine, you better not be concerned about cryptosporidium. But if you don't care about crypto, then you could still use chlorine dioxide and just not have to wait the four hours. In North America, a great many seem to voluntarily forego virus protection as none of these popular filters remove those. 
So how much time would you have to wait with chlorine dioxide treatment if you were just worried about bacteria? Our Aquamira drops hold the key. Remember, for bureaucratic reasons, they were only labeled for bacterial treatment, but it's the same chlorine dioxide as the tablets. Their instructions state to mix, shaken or stirred, and let stand for 15 minutes. If the water is very cold or turbid, wait 30 minutes. Well, that's actually faster than either the iodine or the chlorine, which makes sense because chlorine dioxide is generally more effective. Here are CT tables of chlorine dioxide for cryptosporidium, giardia, and viruses. Bacteria are the easiest to handle, so account for any of these and you're covered for Legionella. So look how much bigger the values are for crypto. At 3 log reduction in 10 C water, the CT is 833. For Giardia, it's only 23. And for viruses at the EPA required 4 logs, it's 25.1. So that means it's over 33 times faster to treat viruses than Cryptosporidium at the same concentration. So if you're using the prescribed 4 parts per million of chlorine dioxide, Per the table, it takes 208 minutes to inactivate the required three logs of crypto, and that's about three and a half hours. So do the same math for viruses, and you're good to go in under seven minutes. For Giardia, it'd be under six minutes, and bacteria are so fast they don't bother to publish a table. And of course, all of this slows down the colder the water gets. At near freezing temperatures, it would take almost eight hours to get three logs of crypto reduction at four parts per million. But even at less than 1 degree C, viruses are still inactivated to EPA standards in about 12 and a half minutes. So no, chlorine dioxide doesn't take longer, it's actually faster. It just has a longer option that the others don't. So what do you do if it's cold out and you don't want to wait 8 hours? Or if you're carrying a chemical that doesn't stop cryptosporidium, the second leading cause of waterborne disease outbreaks in the US. You take the CDC's suggestion and supplement your chemical disinfection with some physical filtration. The filters work by physically excluding particles too large to pass through their media. As such, they excel with the larger pathogens like cysts, and they struggle with the tiniest ones like viruses. And this is the exact opposite of chemical disinfection, and that makes them ideal partners in a combination system. If you run your water through a properly rated filter to first remove the cysts, it doesn't matter which of these you choose, they all handle bacteria and virus as well. And even if you choose the chlorine dioxide, which can handle the crypto, pre-filtering can save you the 4 hour wait. Remember that turbidity and organic matter can not only neutralize some of your active ingredient in the case of chlorine, but also produce unwanted disinfection byproducts, and pre-filtering can help with this as well. Well, let's look at weights and price before we wrap this whole thing up. And dosing instructions vary, so I computed the number of doses per package or container. The iodine bottle, for instance, holds 50 pills, but the dose is 2 pills per quart, so it's 25 doses per bottle. Then, because Aquatabs use one tablet per fifth of a gallon, their dose is 0.8 quarts. So I made a total volume column to show exactly how many total quarts could be treated per product. And bear in mind that most of these can be purchased in different quantities. You can get these pills in uh, 20 or 30 packs. Uh, I saw Aquatabs on Amazon in $350 boxes of 10,000 tablets. And these numbers are for the package sizes that I bought as seen here. When you look at the weight of treatment per quart, there's a clear winner. It's the Aquatabs. And that surprised me. Everybody talks about the drops being the lightest weight option because their volume treated is largest, but it's not even close. And interestingly, chlorine dioxide comes out about the same regardless of whether you go for the tablets or the drops. If you were using chemicals as your primary treatment and you drink six quarts a day, I made columns for how many days each package would last, the weight per day and weight per week. The differences are measurable, but not huge. If you switched from iodine, the heaviest, to chlorine, the lightest, you save 6.8 grams per day, or less than 2 ounces in a week. And as far as price goes, the clear winner in cost per quart is the Aquamira. And for the most part, I've avoided price because it's so volatile and variable, and it can literally vary by the hour, the region, the vendor, etc. All these prices are from Amazon as of February 2021. I have no doubt there are places and times where you can get a better deal. To put this all into perspective, here's a few practical scenarios for field use. 
And say you're not generally concerned about viruses, so you carry one of these or anything in their class as your primary treatment method. These reduce the bacterial and protozoan trespassers in your cool mountain drink. But sometimes hikers find a dead rat floating in their cistern, so you want a backup that's capable of handling a potential viral threat. Well, any of these chemicals have got you covered. Choose the lightest, the cheapest, or the best tasting with the least side effects. Use them in combination with your filter for full pathogenic coverage. Now, if you want a backup in case your filter is lost or damaged, or if you intend to use chemistry as your primary treatment, then you might want to make sure your ingredient of choice is capable of treating all four pathogen types. And that leaves only one of the chlorine dioxide options. And then lastly, for those who dance on the cliff's edge of ultralight, a few minimalist options. For short trips and full pathogenic coverage, you can't beat chlorine dioxide tablets. A Sawyer Mini weighs 40 grams, but you can carry up to 60 tablets, which is two 30 packs and still be technically less than this. So using my estimate of six quarts per day, that means for trips up to 10 days long, the absolute lightest option, again, that treats all pathogen types, are these right here. If you're not worried about crypto, carry the Aqua Tabs for an even lighter option. You can have 29 sheets of 10 tablets each for less than the weight of a mini. That's 290 pills to treat 232 quarts of water. At six quarts a day, you're covered for over 38 days. Okay, but suppose you're not willing to compromise on protection. You want all pathogen types to be treated and you're willing to wait 30 minutes, but don't find four hours practical. Here's the lightest, fastest possible solution that I could find to meet those criteria. Aquamira makes this blue line filter. It's good only for cysts, but it weighs almost half of a mini. And pair it with the aqua tabs that treat bacteria and viruses, and you've got the absolute lightest pieces of two partial systems that together cover the whole range of waterborne threats without the four hour wait. The Frontier Straw is good for 30 gallons, and it has the bonus of an activated carbon element. So for trips up to two weeks, you can carry this plus enough Aqua Tabs to be lighter than a Mini. Treat with the chlorine, and then drink through the filter to remove any cysts, but also some of the chlorine tastes and disinfection byproducts. And it comes with a 3 gram straw, which you could cut down. It's a quarter inch inside diameter, which is the standard for hydration hoses. Personally, for most wilderness water, I'm okay with the bacterial and protozoan protection of your popular hollow fiber membrane filters, and they will last for much longer trips. Now, on the chance I might encounter virally tainted water, I carry a sheet of chlorine dioxide tablets, and that way I can hopefully treat enough water to get me to the next cleaner source. I choose the chlorine dioxide for a full backup in case something happens to my filter. And of course, I've always got the option to pasteurize. Okay, folks, that does it for this installment. The next video in this series will be on the actual filters themselves. As always, I very much appreciate your time, and thanks for watching.